Hi, good evening. Welcome to the August IoT North Meetup. I'm Paul Wheels, I'm the founder and organizer for IoT North. Um, we have our sponsors, uh, wrong way, Go250 and uh, Newcastle University. Um, but can I just ask uh, everybody that's attending, if you don't follow us on Twitter and um, LinkedIn, if you could do, uh, it'd be really appreciated. Uh, we've got a lot of um, information to share as, as time goes on um, to help um, uh, with facilitation of uh, relationships and potential funding. Um, so by all means, please do follow us so we can get the messages out to you. Um, and also on the website, you can register for the newsletter, which will start in the next six weeks. Um, okay. Um, on the website, we have um, a new partner that we work with. Um, I've known them for a number of years now, Lumo. If you are working on anything and um, looking at R&D tax um, credits with the HMRC here in the UK, um, please do check the guys out. If you go onto the partner section of the website of iotnorth.uk, um, you'll find the link there to Lumo. Um, those guys will have, have a chat with you, understand what you've been doing, um, and advise you on the potential that you can get from your R&D tax credits. In the current climate, I'm sure that'll be helpful to a number of you. Um, so please do check that out. Tonight, we have uh, Ian Gardner um, from um, IBM um, talking about Industry 4.0. Um, and we have Michael Liu from Chooch.ai, um, really exciting uh, computer vision um, AI. And I'll, I'm not going too much about my excitement on that one, but we've had some, I've had some great chats with Michael and Ian uh, recently, um, and really looking forward to these chats. So, Ian, good evening. How are you, sir? Very well, thank you. And uh, thanks for uh, giving this opportunity to talk to everybody in IoT North. And it's an absolute pleasure. So Ian and I um, both uh, presented at a 4.0 event a couple of months ago and Ian's, Ian's talk really stood out to me. So reached out to him to, uh, to make sure that I could share, he could share his wealth of knowledge uh, with uh, the members of IT North. Um, Ian, what was the first IoT project that you got involved in? Um, I was thinking about this and you're going back a few years actually and if I think about it you're probably going back to about 1984-85 um, which was a, um, a retail implementation where we we're looking at um, a perpetual inventory for uh, filling the shelves of a, um, a supermarket so it's a long time ago um, I wouldn't say it's anything as advanced as what you see nowadays um, but that <laughs> It was it was definitely bleeding edge. It didn't work, yeah. <laughs> um, but hey, it was it was a good effort. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's a it's a thing of trying. I mean, um, you you totally top trump mine, which was um, early two thousands, which was a telemetry project, right? Uh, okay, on then, uh, which was turning energy on and off um, for the Department of Defence in Australia. Um, you know, you're very active in the four dot zero um, space, manufacturing, logistics. Um, what are you finding to be the, the common starting points to adopt IoT? Um, I, I feel like there's a, a kind of a gravitas there where, where people are, are wanting to, to start doing things. Uh, the starting point for most people seems to be proof of concepts. Um, uh, but then, then we, we seem, to, seem to move into this, this kind of prototype purgatory yeah where that's all that people are doing you know we're not seeing we're, we're, or we've certainly not been seeing many organizations moving beyond that um or at least uh, unless they've been able to see you know immediate benefits so that's that's been the challenge but yeah uh, most people are starting to to explore you know proof points uh point solutions and then hopefully build out from there and it's a building out, which which I'm I'm seeing some you know lack of movement at the moment. Yeah, I mean I've I've witnessed that as well. That um, you know uh, the company I work for by the AD Link, um, we stopped talking about proof of concepts and start talking about experiments, uh, yeah. just to try and help that mind shift with 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 working with people to understand that it was okay to fail. Um, but it would then, you know, pushing an experiment seem to have a smoother transition. So we, we managed to get that process accelerated slightly, but you know, it doesn't take weeks um, like you hope. It takes months, maybe it's even rolling into years for some projects. I think um, I think another another challenge that we've seen as well is that people can't quantify the benefits. 
And you can start doing these things, and you realize that you didn't have the data before to do a, a, to do comparisons. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's actually quite an interesting point is that, you know, it's about the data at the end of the day, but it's also about um, uh, people understanding um, what the uh, what the outcomes are that they're looking for um, and um, setting them as realistic um, as, as an outcome from the proof of concept from the first stage. Because, you know, people have this, a number of businesses I've spoken to have this um, vi um, vision that you can walk in with a load of software and some hardware and all of a sudden they see that the, the world come alive like we do with, with some great um, visualisation that we see in marketing, that um, there's a staged progress through that and it's trying to get them to understand that journey of the starting point and building out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, there's no way from getting away from it. We're, we're still in the thick of uh, COVID-19. Um, what impact are you seeing it having on manufacturing? Uh, <laughs> a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty. <laughs> Um, you know, but at the same time, it, it's going to accelerate all, all the things that we've been talking about for many years now that, that are not moving forward. Uh, I think we're going to see, see things change at an accelerated level. So, um, you know, I think the survivors, the zombie organizations might, might end up disappearing. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think there's a, there is some hope and optimism out there. Uh, there's a lot of money slashing around from uh, from various places and why have you to invest in these changes. And I think culturally as well, there's some changes where, uh, and I'll come into this later, where, you know, the way that we work changes. I mean, like, for example, now we're on a video conference and, um, you know, historically we'd have probably been all in a room together. Yeah. And, and the acceptance of that is there now. You know, people take it for granted. Um, all these, all these technologies, which in the past people thought, you know, oh, that's not for us. Or I, I you know, that trust, you know, well, well, I want to see what my workers are doing. Yeah, yeah, um, that, yeah I think that's interesting. Like we we chatted earlier, it's, it's that culture shift that's really been accelerated, hasn't it? Um, and I think the key word that you mentioned there is trust. Trust has had to be thrown out there. It has, and and in many organisations I've been talking to. Um, they suddenly realised that actually it, it does give benefits, and um, you know they found that in some cases I was I was doing a, a I don't know some kind of review of of some entrants for a, a I think it was Staffordshire University where they were looking at all what the impact was of of all remote working, and yeah. all the comments that uh, that came from that as to what people had done were really really positive. I think it was only one negative thing. Um, but some someone said that they are actually now they they talk they, they've realised that they've got a a new friend in their department who they didn't even know worked in their department before, because of the design of the building, it was um, they were be, were in a separate room or behind a wall or whatever it was. Yeah. Um. So they felt like they were were more part of a community now than the, what what they were before, which surprised me. Yeah. So, hey, I think this leads on quite nicely to, to your talk, so um, I'll uh, leave it for you to, uh, to get away. Okay, okay. Right, so let's try and share my screen now. So let's um, see what happens, fingers crossed. Okay, can you all see that? Are we all right? Yeah, it's coming through great. Fantastic. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to talk about digitalization, uh, if I can spell that. It looks like I've spelt it wrong there. Interesting start. Uh, and integration. But one thing I also wanted to talk about as well was the impact of uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic. Um, it's quite topical. Uh, impacts manufacturing. Um, it, it may get a bit disjointed at times because, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a new new presentation for me. But let's see where we go. If you've got any questions, then you know, put them in the chat box. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure Paul will, will mediate that uh, or moderate it, and um, you know, hopefully we can get some discussion going rather than it's just me talking. So, so please, please ask questions. Um, we'll see how far we get with this, because, uh, like I say, if we get a lot of dialogue, a lot of questions on these, I don't think it's a bad thing, um, and we'll just see where we go. 
So, okay. Right, it's moving forward. Okay, so a bit about me. Yeah, I've had a long history working in consultancy. Uh, spent about 25 years implementing ERP systems, you know, large scale complex projects. Um, I was played a leading role in a, a large scale industry 4.0 project called Make It M4. That was the reference project within the UK government's made smarter requirement report from Jürgen Meyer. I was a finalist in the 2018 Times UK Management Consulting Awards. I'm the chair of Sheffield University Industry Advisory Board and a few other universities as well. And I lecture as well at Imperial College, Sheffield, Loughborough and Staffordshire Universities. Um, that's, that's a bit about me and a few uh, accreditations as well. So first thing I want to say is that, you know, it's all about data, whatever we talk about. Um, you know, data is the, is the thing that's going to change how we work, what we do, um, and, and how we use technology. So, so I'd start by saying, you know, I know we have machines, I know we have processes and everything, but it's data that, that will change that. So keep, keep that in the back of your mind. And when, when we look at Industry 4.0, it's, it's kind of a convergence of technologies rather than being one big thing. Um, you know, we've got robotics, uh, we've got um, additive manufacturing, AI, cloud. Um, but for all these things, there's, there's a, uh, what we're seeing is increased capability and falling costs. So we can do more now uh, with these technologies. But the costs are falling, which means they're becoming more accessible. The returns on investments are changing. So we can start looking at um, using these technologies, um, you know, things like 5G, Edge, uh, really important what they can do. But two areas that I've, I've kind of noticed that play a big part in, in you know, driving us forward on that journey, uh, user experience and the circular economy. So user experience, you know, uh, our clients, our workers, etc., they want everything yesterday. You know, they're not just happy with, with uh, you know, a, a standard dashboard or a spreadsheet. They want more than that. They want things to be more immersive in, in how they work. And the circular economy, you know, that's becoming more and more important. And, um, and you know, with COVID now, there's a lot of talk about sustainability and, and how we treat our environment and, and, and the impact of that. So it's not just one thing, it's multiple things. And why, why would we? Why do we want to do all these kind of things? Well, you know, we've got an aging workforce. Um, the availability of people is, is becoming more challenging. Um, we, we, we're losing skills. Um, we've, we've got higher expectations for quality and service. We, we expect more for reliability. So we've got key drivers like, you know, usual time, quality, um, et cetera, that, that we need to, and costs that we need to think about. Um, and, and the expectations, like I said earlier, you know, tomorrow starts now, we're, we're not happy with that, that standard dashboard. So why the interest? And, and I, see, I see three, sorry, two, two perspectives. So there's obviously an innovation perspective. That tends to be the area that startups look at. That doesn't exclude mature organizations because they can be innovative. But the startups want to be a bit more disruptive, want to lose, use these technologies to, to do things differently. Um, whereas mature organizations, they're kind of looking for more cost savings and efficiencies in the way that they, they do things. Um, they will still look at innovation, but they have a different focus. But, you know, to move forward, we, we, it's too easy to focus on, on just on technology because people and technology and processes need to adapt to this change. It's not just a case of, of just implementing technology or, you know, it takes time. People need to have a culture, which, you know, Paul was talking about earlier, is really, really important. And we can't forget that, you know, these three, three areas and, and, you know, funding, I suppose, is a fourth area on this. And it's really important. When, when we think, cast our minds back to the, the invention of, of electricity, it took 50 years before it had any impact at all 
on uh, on productivity. And the main reason for that was that you know all all the factories were doing was just replacing the you know steam engines which which powered an entire factory with a big electric motor. Uh, so nothing changed. It was only when they started looking at the the factory as a system that uh, they could actually kind of get some productivity gains. Um, and, and the same applies now. So Paul, if, if you've got any questions coming to me, or want me to stop and ask questions, please, please just sh uh, stop me. Yeah, I will do it. <laughs> okay. So, but then, then beginning of this year, we, we, we've had COVID-19, you know, this pandemic. And that really has turned things upside down. Um, I mean, from a, a serious perspective, we, we all know that, uh, you know, we're moving now into this new normal. But what does that new normal mean? I mean, it's not all been been bad because what we've seen is that some companies have done quite well out of this, but particularly a big tech companies, I mean, we look at Amazon, um, you know, Jeff um, Bezos has, uh, you know, his retirement pot seems to be swelling nice. Uh, things like Zoom, uh, Zoom Video, we're only a small organization. Uh, they've, they've done incredibly well. Um, so what we're seeing is that the companies that are growing are all around, you know, uh, communications, e-commerce, uh, collaboration, um, and and it's made a, a huge a huge difference to those organisations. I always think that you know the performance performance of these organisations is a good exam a good measure as to what what the growth areas there are. But for manufacturing, what, what we've seen is that actually it's lost seventy five percent of its economic output every day at the height of the coronavirus lockdown. That's you know that's part of UK powerhouse report. That's a massive, massive drop. I mean, you've only got to think about the car industry. You know, no one's even driving. You know, the, the oil price, you know, where uh, the price of oil became, was it minus $37 per barrel at one point? Because, you know, people just weren't using these things. So it's a massive, massive impact. So how can the manufacturing industry, um, you know, absorb that? And it's, it's global. It, it's, it's not just the UK. This is, this is a global effect. You know, we've got movement restrictions where, you know, we, we can't, we're not shipping goods around. Uh, we're not shipping people around. So skills are becoming more, uh, more difficult to, 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 to kind of transplant here, there and everywhere. We've got lockdowns where, you know, staff couldn't go into, uh, into their workplaces. That's kind of changing a bit now. Social distancing, um, you know, PPE um, and production diversification, where you know a lot of organisations have diversified into things that are needed, such as you know we saw the um, ventilator production, etc. Um, you know stuff like PPE production uh, and and supply chains. Suddenly now we're thinking, okay, well, do we do we really need to bring all these goods in from China? You know, have we, can can we rely on that 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 uh, that, that lag? You know that lead time before the goods arrive. Maybe we need to diversify. Maybe we need to look at you know uh, reshoring manufacturing. Maybe we need to um, you know broaden our supply chain base. And then remote working, where you know in the past you know most people were in were in their offices uh, or or factories or whatever. But now it's it's like well actually we don't need those people. We can we can leave them working at home. We we suddenly now we trust those workers to do that work remotely. And, and that, these are big changes. And then look at, think about childcare issues. You know, the schools were closed. And this is like, say it's not a UK problem where it's, it's almost like parenting from work. You've, you've got people who are working from home with kids at home and they're just trying to manage because there's no childcare available, which creates flexibility needs. Uh, but there's a lot of uncertainty out there. And, and these challenges cover many areas. So, you know, for finance, for cash flow, you know, how, if you, if you can't make the goods, you're not getting the money in. If the, you know, it's, it's just really, really difficult. How do you plan your capex? Uh, and, and, you know, predictions and simulations can be quite, quite helpful in this. 
you know, technology and data, AI, machine learning can help uh, plan for some of these things, for these, these kind of, uh, if as say, for example, a second or third wave. So supply chain, you know, we've got planning challenges, we've got communication challenges, um, and, and managing those supplier and customer um, relationships is, is difficult. So we need to expand those supply chains so that we've got bigger sources of, um, of materials or, or where we can reach more customers. And, and then, you know, we've got the human capital management uh, issues, the HR issues, where flexibility, you know, we, we, we really do need that. But how do you plan and track your leave of, leave of absence? How do you manage, you know, searching for skills um, when, when you've got a, um, you know, a, a pot of people that are out and about or, or working from home where you can't just go and, go and ask the team? So, you know, operations wise, we need more flexibility. We've got knowledge challenges where we need a broader or, or a, a clever of source of knowledge. Uh, was the need for automation, more automation, collaboration and communications. And then how do you approve things? Crikey, that gets difficult. But if you, if you can't just knock on someone's desk and say, can you just sign this? How does it work? It's all it, I've, got a, I've got a question here. Um from uh, Dwayne Campbell. Um, in 2002, uh, 2018, 2019, the government commissioned some very strong research, research that shows the UK have productivity gap in digital skills crisis that is more prominent and problematic in small business, 10 to 50 employees sector. Mm -hmm. How will IoT help the small business sector? Any thoughts? Um, you know, that's, you know, it's more of a productivity puzzle. And productivity gap because you know a lot of analysis, uh, analysis has been done on this and I don't think there's a clear answer as to you know what's causing that and I, I have my own theories but what I do wonder is whether or not uh, for, for other areas in Europe or, or globally um, there's more investment in or more um, acceptance of technology where you can automate uh, operations and I'll come into that, and I do. That, that, that's probably my thinking as to, you know, how how do we do di things differently? I know in the UK we we've we've had a big dependency on um, on kind of you know global resourcing, uh, etc. Where you know you've got a choice: do you do you invest so many thousand pounds or tens of thousand pounds in new machinery or technology? Or do you just bring some more people in where you've got that flexibility where you can say, okay, I don't need you anymore. I think most people would choose, choose the people side of it because you just say, okay, that gives me more, more capacity um, at, at lower risk. Um, but I don't think there's a clear answer. And, and I've never read, uh, you know, there's lots of debate going about this, but not, I've not seen any answers yet. But I, I, I'll, I'll come into that actually when, when we move on and see how, how technology and data can, can make a difference. But for small organisations, it's even more difficult because what, what, what skills do you have? You know, you can't have a specialist because, you know, people are multitasking. Most small organisations I talk to, the really small companies, it's almost like the hobbyists are becoming their, their technical experts. You know, well, I've done a bit of this at home, and um, and it's that challenge of, of naivety, uh, where people are working real, you know, doing fantastic things, but but doing it as if they've been <laughs> we're looking after something on the you know at home rather than um, you know in a in a work area, so it, it, it's really difficult. But there are solutions out there. Yeah, I think that, I think that leads on to uh, Kevin Hunter from uh, SAP. Thanks for this, Kevin. Um, as he was stating, I uh, certainly know from the company that I represent as well, that a lot of the IoT hardware uh, and software companies, and a lot of hardware companies are now acquiring software companies, so they've got that more of a plug-and-play solution, as, as Kevin states here, which enables that downskilling the automation market, which helps the smaller businesses that can afford to hire an automation engineer or a third-party company um, uh, that can't afford. Um, that you know the plug and play and the, and the evolution of of, of IoT um, is is coming to that point now where the plug and play side of things 
is um, really helping to to drive that adoption and reducing the cost as well. Um, and you know, like companies like TeamViewer and such like are bringing up some really interesting plug and play um, products as well to enable this type of automation. But then you've also, um, but that actually creates a new skill gap, um, which is the data science side, so that people understand the data. Um, you know, it's one thing understanding how to connect things and such like, but then how to, um, you can, with the level, create the automation, but then to start to draft the autonomy is a new skill set, which is, there is quite a skill gap out there. And that's just my, my personal view from validation I've done over the past year. I think as well, with, with you know, the advent of, or the growth of open source is something that's changing the way that we do things as well, because um, rather than proprietary software, uh, if, if you've got open standards and communities, if you've got a question, rather than relying on SLAs and what have you, you can post a question now to a, a community on, on using open source stuff um, and you'll get a response. You know, there, there's a lot of passionate uh, technologists or, or, you know, advocates of, of all these systems and, and, and technologies where they'll just pile and say, well, you know, why don't you do this? Or, or just even, you know, thousands of eyes looking at that code, which is probably far more people than you'd ever have on, um, you know, a proprietary system. So, so you know, standards need to become more open. They, they become, need to become more uh, standardized in the, you know, stuff like OPC UA, CFX. Um, it, it's, it's really important that we, we start developing, you know, these, these normal standards where we, we're not having to, um, <laughs> to to kind of create new things all the time but i think open source is a big is a big opportunity for for smaller organizations yeah, yeah. Ian, it's kevin here just to back you up on something that you said there the standardization part is critical uh, if you if you go back in time you know some of us are old enough to remember serial ports yeah. you know, or usb so, you know, the challenges we had back then was, you know, the multiple different types of connectors, whether it was null modem or non-null modem, et cetera. Whenever you plugged anything into a PC, it just didn't work. Yeah. So, and USB came out to standardize that. Now, in the IoT world, a lot of the sensor companies have done the same with a technology called IO-Link. Yeah. So basically, it's a single standard. All the manufacturers built to the standard, and you could just plug and play all their hardware together. Some of them talk OPC UA. So their uh, IO-Link uh, boxes talk OPC UA. So again, you've got standardization on the hardware, you've got standardization on the software, and now everything becomes quite simple. Add in open source software, yeah. Small companies can now do some amazing automation without having to hire experts. Yeah, and, and that's the fear because I don't know whether they don't trust the experts or they just think it's gonna to be too expensive because yeah. IT is not cheap, you know. <laughs> We, we, we like to we like to charge well <laughs> oh yes <laughs> yeah I think I think that's one of the one of the big things is the expectation of cost um, but thanks for that Kevin um, Michael um, I'm, I apologize but I'm not going to try and pronounce your name so I, I don't get it wrong um, but on, on the uh, messenger here I think with the right partnerships and strong collaboration effort between tech company uh, tech companies could help bridge the gap Data technology and AI could help us embrace the future if we apply the right regulations and ethical use. I think yep. we'd be hopeful. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think we're I think we're on that that start of the curve with with the um, with the AI side of things as well. Um, and Leon's just shared device pilot. Sorry, Ian, please. No, that's, that's fine. I, I'll, I'll totally echo that. In that, um, you know, ethics is a big is a big um, a, bit, a big story in this. Um, but the opportunities that it presents are absolutely massive. But we need to be, we need to be open-minded. We need to be uh, mindful of the pitfalls um, because there are plenty. Uh, but the the possibilities, and I'll come into where we can use this uh, later on. But you know, communication tools, all these things. A lot of organisations never even dreamt of using any video conferencing, or, or you know, they'd use it on a on quite sparingly. That's changed now. And collaboration tools like Mural, where you suddenly can do brainstorming um, remotely, uh, stuff like Slack, Trello for, um, you know, like Kanban boards, Monday, all of these things are, are suddenly growing and growing um, 
from from nowhere. Um, and then you know we've <laughs> here we've <laughs> I stuck this in. IBM's developed a worker insights platform to to kind of respond to to the COVID crisis, where we we thought, well, okay, people are wanting to return to work. How do we monitor social distancing or crowd density? How do we monitor you know no go zones and fever monitor and everything? And, and IBM's not alone in this. You know, lots of organisations are, are producing tools uh, that can help with this. And a lot of this driven is driven by AI, you know, visual recognition and what have you, or crowd control, stuff that was was developed for security in the past, uh, but has now been repurposed to, to try and keep us safe in a different way. But all that collaboration and everything, you know, what about your production activities? For most organizations, their machines, etc., they're, they're quite dumb. Um, you know, they're not producing data, or if they are producing data, you've probably got a dashboard or a, you know, a terminal at the side of that machine, they're giving you data. But uh, in the past, you know, the, 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 the shift lead or team lead or whatever would walk around the, the shop floor and just say, okay, well, what's happening? You can see it all, you can talk to the, uh, the, the operatives, etc. But now, you know, there's, there's probably a, a, a real use case where I say, okay, well, I'd like to do this without, what, um, you know, pounding the shop floor. And, and I don't know how many organizations can do this at the moment. Um, and and that's, this is going to be one of those drivers for change. And last year I was, I was at a big conference in, in Germany and I was asking the uh, delegates there what, what was holding them back. And they saw lots of opportunities um, in, in what the data could present. Um, but it said, you know, the thing that was holding them back was either fear or the owners of their organizations, which baffled me for a while. And, um, and that kind of made me think that it must be the business case can't be right. Because if there's a clear business case, then, then people would be investing more, you know, we'd be moving away from these proof of concepts. Um, but when I asked them what would change their minds as to, you know, invest, etc., it came down to legislation which obviously forces change or um, or market forces and and now i guess we've got this other thing which is um covid 19 and the pandemic and the changes that that's presented and this is you know this is um where we're talking about the productivity um slowdown and um, what i also noticed from when i was looking at this curve was you know does is the uk's adoption of technology lower than other countries but also, it seems to line up exactly with when the iPhone was launched. So what, what does that mean? I've no idea. Uh, maybe I should blame Apple. I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's, it's an interesting conundrum. Could, could that be to... Because Apple, Apple actually made smartphones smart and usable. If you think about the experience, I mean, back then, you know, as, as the iPhone launched, I was, I was, my rule was selling phones. Um, if you think about the the Windows experience um, uh, for, for smartphones back then, um, it was awful. There was there wasn't very many apps. The apps that were there were really made for PC, so it just killed the phone because it used all your battery, all your RAM. Um, that Apple actually created an experience that people that it did start to change people's experience, uh, expectations of how things should look and feel. Do you think that's got a bit of a point on that trend? I had no idea. I mean, you'd like to think that by 2018 that would have rectified itself, um, but it's just been flat since then. So I have no idea. Um, Dwayne thinks it was more to do with the financial crisis. Um, yeah, you'd, you'd like to hope it's not down to a phone. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's interesting. And cloud computing, you know, the, the, the promises that that's developed. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, who knows? If it was a simple answer, then, um, you know, we'd, we'd have an answer, but it is, it is known as the productivity puzzle. Yeah, Peter, Peter, uh, Peter does raise a, a point well um, about um, how does it compare to other countries. 
Um, Keith Lawson, um, more than when the iPhone came along, general management on tech projects became very, very unrealistic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, possibly so. That, that really resonates with me. That, yeah, but a big, sorry, a big problem we had was that, you know, around about that time, we had a lot of management would come in and they would just think we could do what was on the iPhone. Yeah. Like, you know, a small team of, like, developers, like, in their spare time. We didn't understand that, you know, the iPhone and things like the iWatch have, like, these massive development teams. I, th I think if, if, these, these were the, the, if this was the case, though, we'd see this in other countries, and that's, that's not the case. So it's just a UK problem. Or maybe we, as a culture, we're just like looking at our phones instead. I'm looking at cat videos. Who knows? But what we can yeah, say. I, so I'm, from, from my experience, I spent a lot of time in the US up until about three, four years, about four years ago. Um, I spent about four or five years out there and I spent a bit of time in Latin America and, and Asia at the time as well. Um, and I've got to say my experience in the US, in the real world of uh, solutions and even applications for the iPhone now, um, they were lower quality than the quality of home to, of apps developed in the UK. And for example, things like Just Eat, um, for those types of services in the US, from my experience, they were about two or three years behind. Um, and, and even the apps when they did bring them out was so low quality compared to the first version of Just Eat. Um, don't know, don't know, no, no idea. But what I do know is that, you know, digitalization uh, and using data and, and, you know, computerization does make a difference to productivity. And, and you know, it, it's, it's something that, that people need to think about. And uh, okay, these, these probably, you know, they do play a part in manufacturing, um, but not, not as much as what we'd be talking about with, with Industry 4.0. Um, but this is, this is interesting. I took this from uh, Forrester, uh, which was a detailed report, and I thought, well, I can't go through all that with you. Um, and th but this was looking at how COVID-19 will change business and technology uh, in the short, medium, and long term. So, for example, with customer experiences, well, you know, they're, they're battling with old habits at the moment. Um, but they're making more online purchases. I mean, it, it fascinates me in that I, I used to go, always go to my veg shop and uh, it'd be cash only. And, and it was a very traditional model. But now suddenly I can order my veg online from them. Um, I get a text message asking me to pay where I just click on a button and I paid them. They don't need to take cash. And it's, it's suddenly they're taking this digital experience and that's just uh, of existence, which is a, a small vegetable, vegetable shop. And I'm thinking, well, how, how on earth does that work? Uh, people are, you know, kind of thinking about more community led actions uh, where they're thinking about more social responsibility in their locality. Um, but for, for work, uh, you know, people are thinking, well, hang on me, I need to automate processes now because I can't, I, I, where, where can I replace humans with automation and AI uh, in the short term just to try and bridge this gap where I, I, I can't rely on people being in the office or, or on the shop floor. But they're also investing in, in training uh, where they can kind of combine automation, automation with humans, that kind of augmented intelligence which is really, really important. And that's, that's where I see AI, machine learning, playing its biggest role. Um, and we can see the shift from permanent work, uh, was it permanent in residence work to, to remote work. Um, but there's gonna be moves from, you know, high cost urban areas to, to lower cost areas because people don't need to be in the center of these cities. And policies where you know, people couldn't be bothered to change them because they're a bit outdated, but just didn't, didn't have the energy. Those policies now are being forced through because there's a good reason to change and the cities are gonna compete for this digital elite. But for technology, you know, um, to meet these COVID restrictions, etc., people are gonna start thinking, okay, it's gotta be touch free. Uh, we're looking for low contact solutions, government funding for tech innovation is going to be, you know, is out there, you know, until the crisis, we've got the Made Smarter uh, initiative from, from the government, but this is just going to grow and grow and grow. 
and uh, and capacity is going to be repurposed for supply chain making different things or uh, or looking for different sources and it's an opportunity for people to re-platform existing systems those systems that didn't give that opportunity to to change to to you know move into this digital age um will it'll become more essential to change those because otherwise you cannot adapt and we need that adapt adaptability and flexibility to survive in this so you know we, we're moving into this digital arms race where we're talking you know robotic process automation or digital process automation is becoming more and more important where at the moment you might have somebody just keying in data or whatever or, or use you know translating paper documents then that needs that can be replaced using robotic process automation um, to, to feed your bigger systems like you know the ERP, ERP systems for example where you're thinking well I can't I don't want to invest in, or it's going to be a struggle creating a, an API or an interface into this into SAP or, or whatever um, why don't you use RPA for that but on the medium term you know these these are going to be uh, a bit more uh, I don't know how long this medium term is I couldn't get that from Forrester but they were saying okay there's going to be uh, a different level of brand commitment and that, that social responsibility um, we, we won't we'll move away from from brands that we feel are not being responsible or not helping us on this cause. Um, these early adopters will become mainstream. Um, we'll, we'll be looking for better experiences. So, you know, if we find that someone's not, um, you know, uh, protecting our privacy and we don't trust them, then we'll move somewhere else. Uh, and that ability to move will become far more frequent. Um, for work, yeah, employment levels will recover, thankfully. I hope they do. Um, but we'll be using less call centres. We'll not be using those. Oh, you go through your day. <laughs> Yo, sorry? Was that a question? I'm not sure. Okay, anyway. Um, so there'll be more diversification. There'll be reshored uh, manufacturing where we can exploit all these you know, advances in robotics and, um, you know, additive manufacturing, etc. where it doesn't matter. We don't have to be in a low cost economy to produce these goods. And digital services will expand in developing nations. So there'll be lots and lots of things, but, um, you know, from technology perspective, people will probably become complacent and move back to their old practices. Um, we will exploit technology enabled innovation um, but they'll become more white label services as well, where, you know, a bit like we were talking about standards and standardization. What we'll find is that technology companies will start producing white label um, solutions. And that could be through open source or, or whatever, but it'll, underpinning that will be, you know, that kind of technology that supports it all, which it might be proprietary, who knows. So there's, there's lots of changes here, you know, moving on to long term where, you know, it, it's people will be looking for uninhibited mobility. Uh, Wage-wise, suddenly you might find that there's going to be global compensation benchmarks where you'd say, okay, well, there's no such thing as a low-cost economy. Because someone will say, well, hang on a minute, I'm doing exactly the same job at the same productivity rates as, as someone in a, a developed nation. So it's going to be interesting and, and the investors are going to prize adaptability and agility and that's exactly what we need now we need to be become more responsive you know as these these waves come through with covid etc we need to be able to respond but all all of these changes you know whatever digitalization we put into our organizations they have to be driven by the non-functional requirements and again we always forget about these. Um, you know, we get excited about functional requirements. This is how I want it to work. You forget about stuff as, you know, accessibility, um, how, how you're gonna manage performance, maintenance, the resilience of the systems, the, the size and the capacity. How's it gonna grow? Uh, integration and compliance as well, because what I'm starting to see now, particularly around compliance, is that the architectures that we develop are becoming more policy driven. Uh, and I'm almost saying it's policy-defined policy architectures where, you know, legal regulation, performance requirements, uh, ethical requirements, 
define those architectures. And that's particularly important around looking at modern architectures where you're using containers, um, you know, where you've got container factories and functions and microservices. Those, those factories that produce those con um, uh, uh, containerized software or functions will be defined by, by policies. And, um, and that's really, really important. But the way, the way that we, we implement solutions these days is changing. You know, in the past, we, talk, we like to talk agile, um, but you don't need to use the old methods of, of building things. I know we talk about, you know, pilot purgatory or, or prototype purgatory, but when you look at garage methods now, you can actually produce a, a, a solution pretty quick, but you need to think about long-term as well. So nowadays, you know, you'd use, you'd use design thinking to define where you're gonna put the solution, where it's gonna deliver the most value. And then you build a prototype, a rapid prototype, you know, within two weeks, say. Then you test it, you throw it in the bin if it didn't work, or you might just produce it and put, push it into production. Um, but to do this, you really need to think about a platform for how you're gonna introduce all this software and technology such as AI, um, machine learning, analytics. You need to think about these. Uh, so platforms such as you know, IBM Cloud, I've, I've gotta say that working for IBM, but there are also other, plat other platforms out there, some proprietary, some not, um, and, and some open source. The, the choice out there is incredible. But if you've got a platform, say for example, you know, um, a Kubernetes platform where you can package your applications up, you can do continuous deployment where you've got no downtime at all, where you can develop solutions and functions for your machines and your factory in a very short space of time without interfering with other operations. And that's the big difference. So this time scale in the old school, I mean, I, I've spent too many years for any ERP systems. When I originally put any ERP systems in, it would take, you know, three years to put one in, maybe sometimes longer, and a lot of money. Uh, nowadays, you know, you can put an ERP in, in in three, four months if you if you're brave enough. Um, and, and that's part of a change. So what should you invest in? If you're looking at investing in in digital for your um, for your organization uh, what's going to make the biggest difference and uh, basically this this was from um, you know a lot of research from from Forrester again uh, only in July so it's quite it's quite recent very recent so if we look at the business value um, and the and the maturity levels really you know um, what offers the highest value you know, asset performance management, performance management software, where you can see uh, how your machines are performing, you know, whether or not they need maintenance, whether or not they're, they're running slower than other machines. Uh, digital twins, edge computing. Edge computing is, is gonna be absolutely massive, uh, really important. Internet of Things platforms, yeah, there's lots of those out there. Uh, from every, every vendor's got an Internet of Things platform. Um, machine learning and AI. You know, massive opportunities there. Um, the only the only kind of thing that's going to hold you back on these things is is probably your imagination. And for that, I'd say that you really need to think about stuff like design thinking as a process to identify those. So design thinking is a way that you can look at your operations in your organisation, but look at it through the eyes of of a user. And that user could be a customer, an employee, could be a machine, could be anything. Uh, but it's all based on empathy. It's a very democratic process. Um, but from it, you usually find that you get fantastic ideas. So I'd recommend anyone, you know, to, to, to introduce design thinking when you're deciding what, what you want to invest in. Otherwise, you're picking gut feel, you know, based on gut feel. And you could pick the wrong, the wrong opportunity uh, to invest in. And then, you know, the other high value items, that are high, high maturity are things like, you know, connected machines, you know, get them all talking to each other. Um, ERP says more people, most people have ERP these days. Um, a lot of people have robots, not always, 
but it's important that we start investing in more robots. They're getting cheaper all the time. Um, and, and then all the normal stuff, you know, the MESs, the PLMs, and the PLCs, etc. cetera. Um, but what is interesting is that, you know, stuff like historian data that you know, captures data on, on all operations, it's not actually that valuable anymore because it's, it's just data, you know, it's only really useful when you start enriching that data with, with other things, like you're, you're over, you know, connecting things together. Um, it doesn't mean it's, it's totally redundant because it still plays an important part, but it, its value would rise if it become part, becomes part of, of other, other operations. Um, Ian, uh, we've got a, a question here, uh, just being conscious of time as well, because we're, we're hitting on yep. 7 o'clock. Um, what impact has this had on IBM in terms of how staff work, numbers employed, profitability, focus on services being provided to customers, etc.? Um, I, I think for IBM, it's, it's, it has been changed because, you know, we're a services organisation as well as a technology company. So we're not on client sites as much. But a lot of these tools, you know, remote working, collaboration tools, etc. cetera, we're, we're, we're kind of in that world anyway. Um, I, I, I believe we released our H2 figures uh, last month, and it sounds like we've had a good uh, first, uh, first two halves, but um, that's possible like two halves. But anyway, the first half was, <laughs> was pretty good. Um, so I, I think, you know, we're... we're we're absorbing more remote working is becoming more acceptable to clients. So where in the past they'd say, okay, yeah, expensive. We want to see you. Um, we're, we're finding that, you know, it's, it, it is changing the way we work, but we've always been embracing these, this way of working anyway, for a long time. We've had this, uh, this kind of working from home mentality. So I'll just move on from this, you know, these are the things that people would be looking at. Um, you know, areas that we'll be looking at, uh, or you should be looking at predictive maintenance, asset management, uh, 5G, you know, the, um, the the government announced last week that uh, there's going to be the 5G test bed uh, based in the Northwest. IBM is going to be part of that. Uh, so that offers, you know, lots of exciting opportunities where people can test 5G, worker safety, automated production lines. Um, a lot more video analytics as well, uh, quality detection and correction, kind of uh, prescriptive analytics. So lots of things. I'll move on from this. I'll just finish on this one slide if I can come to it. Uh, standards. Um, so this is, is kind of my, my map I put together as to where, where are you and where do you want to be? Uh, and it kind of goes through the, the stages where you need to think about, you know, if a lot of companies, most organizations are starting probably fall into the first two categories on this. Um, when I ask them where they want to be, they're, they're probably saying, okay, well, you know, most of them say, okay, I want to be number four. Number five being a cognitive organization. Cognitive computing is all about um, replicating or simulating human, human interaction or human, human behaviours. Uh, but more, that's probably a step too far for a lot of organisations, but most of them say, okay, well, I want to be an intelligent organisation where everything's connected, where I could go a richer context of source of data. It's important that organisations start looking at information architectures and enterprise information architectures where they can pull information from multiple sources, um, but really start using that, uh, learning machine learning, et cetera, look at that move away from proof of concepts, look at security. Security is really important. Don't, don't neglect it because you'll get bitten. Uh, but at the same time, don't, don't fear it to the point where you won't move forward. Um, so, you know, but reality is you will get hacked, but you need to think about how you're going to respond to that. So there needs to be, um, you know, a lack of naivety there. You need to be open to, to how, how you can operate in this environment. So, you know, I, I always think this is a good, a good discussion point as far as, you know, where are you, where you want to be. Um, but also be aware that there's some lag moving from point one to point four. So if, you, if you're wanting to use AI and machine learning, it tends to be quite 
data dependent. You know, you need a lot of data. And um, if you start adding sensors and everything to your machines, which, you know, you can do quite cheaply, it's gonna, you might be talking six months to a year. Uh, you know, I don't know how long it would be. It depends how much throughput you've got. But you could find that there's a bit of lag before you can actually start doing anything with, um, you know, proper, proper AI and machine learning. And think about your architectures as well. Think about how, how are you going to manage that technology? Think about, you know, container platforms. And, and apologies if you don't know what containers are, but a container is, is really where you can package up uh, functions or technologies, which, you know, everything's, everything's packed up. So you can move that onto different environments. And that means that could be on the cloud, off the cloud. It could be on the edge. It doesn't matter. And it's a small package of a function. So it should be able to run independently of other functions, a bit like a microservice. So think about the, you know, moving to the cloud uh, where possible. Think about platforms. Uh, think about modern cloud native technologies like microservices, agile, um, garage methods, and, um, and, and containers like uh, Kubernetes or, or IBM, I'll say IBM's OpenShift platform, Red Hat OpenShift platform, I should we say. Um, I think that was it from me, really. I mean, this is all coming into edge computing and everything, but, you know, I, I'd be happy to, to talk more another time if people wanted to go into anything in more detail, Paul. That's great. Thank you very much, um, Ian. Ian, if you could share those slides, they'd, they'd, they'd be great. There's some great intelligence there. Um, does anybody have any questions for Ian? By all means, turn yourself off mute if you would like to uh, ask a question. I'll move to the back so it's got my contact details on there as well. Whoop. Ah, gone. Okay. Excellent, Ian. Thanks for that. that. Was that was brilliant? I really appreciate it. Um, okay, let's try and use technology. It's not catching me up. Okay, Ian. Thanks very much.